then some North Carolina voters are showing up to the polls and being told you've already voted. What election officials are blaming for this mix up. And investigators say a home robbery in Cary may be tied to a South American theft ring that's been hitting homes in at least six more states with some sophisticated methods. What else we dug up about the organization? The weather couldn't be better out at the North Carolina State Fair. I'm live with a closer look at the timing of two cold fronts arriving to North Carolina and whether or not any rain could creep into your weekend fair forecast. All right, let's get started. Can you believe we are less than two weeks away now from Election Day? I know we've been saying that a lot, but seriously, this thing is right around the corner. And with so little time left, the the little details are coming to the fore. Thanks for joining us here at 7 o'clock. I'm Dan Haggerty. And I'm Ashley Rowe. Election security is in the spotlight this year, and we've seen a few strange stories unfold, haven't we? There were those mail-in ballots in Chatham and Durham counties that were already sealed. Elections officials blamed humidity from Helene. Those same officials said folks could get a new ballot. Then there was that confusing little text message that people were getting uh, on Monday. It was telling people that they might not have voted even though they definitely already had voted. Those texts are legal, by the way, and don't really serve any other purpose than to simply mess with people. At least that's how they're taking it. And today, here we go again. A voter told WREL she got a similar message, except it was the opposite. It said she did vote when, in fact, she had it. Right. Uh, you can see how little things like this are becoming a big deal. WREL Capitol Bureau Chief Laura Leslie spent the day getting to the bottom of this problem. Noelle Brown is what you might call a highly engaged voter. She was really looking forward to casting her ballot at a Wake County early voting site Monday. And there was only one person in front of me, so I thought I hit the jackpot, you might say. But her anticipation quickly turned into frustration when she was told she had already voted by mail. Heck no, I haven't voted by absentee ballot. I've never voted by absentee ballot. Never. The minutes stretched on as the workers at the early voting site clustered around a computer and asked her more questions. I was becoming very disappointed at a minimum and a little nervous. I mean, I didn't want to get in trouble for voting twice when I haven't. The chief judge eventually let her cast her ballot, but she was still worried. I am concerned about third party actors because I have never voted absentee. Wake County Elections Director Olivia McCall had the answer. She said another voter with the same name, Noelle Brown, had voted by mail, and that was the record the worker first pulled up. She said there are a lot of similar names in a county with more than 857,000 voters. We have um, different spellings of different names. Um, So we have hyphenated names, and sometimes they didn't register with that hyphenated name, or um, maybe the spelling is off. Um, So for us, we ask additional questions to make sure that we ensure that we have the right person. Those additional questions clarified that Brown was not the same voter who had already voted. There was a slight difference in how the names were spelled. So Brown was able to cast her ballot. It might take a little bit. Um, you know, added time to research and make sure that we do have the right voter. But it's also important for the voters to give us information that would help, like a a spelling of a name can help, um, you know, if there's an E on the end of a name versus not. McCall says if this happens to you, try to be patient. She said even if they can't figure it out on the spot, you will still be allowed to vote a provisional ballot and elections officials will research it and get to the bottom of it before the final vote count. Laura Leslie, WRAL News, Raleigh. Now, look, we know a lot of you have questions and concerns. We are keeping our our, our eye on any and all voting issues. And these, as we've been saying, these little things could be the stuff that ends up as big lawsuits and court cases down the road. One of the more high profile controversies involves Elon Musk. He's been giving away a million dollars every day to a registered voter who signs the petition for his political action committee. Musk is obviously an outspoken supporter of former President Trump, and he picks one winner from somewhere in the country every day and will do so until Election Day. He he started last week. That means 17 people will win a million bucks. And it just so happens you may know one of them. 
The latest winner is someone from our area. This is Andy from Holly Springs of all places. He got his million dollar check right there. Even got a little congratulations from Elon Musk on Twitter. You might think that that sounds great. I'm sure Andy thinks that sounds very great, but the DOJ isn't so sure. This week, they warned Musk that his sweepstakes might in fact be illegal. No matter where it ends up landing, this may pop up again in the days and weeks ahead. And you can again count on us to keep an eye on it for you. All right, so let's get you caught up on the big news stories of the day. Here are five things you should know right now. Today, lawmakers announced Helene has cost North Carolina at least $53 billion. Governor Roy Cooper says he wants state lawmakers to pass $3.9 billion in the form of a down payment for recovery efforts. Private insurance, state and federal funding would kick in about $20 billion. That still leaves another $30 billion hole. State Budget Director Kristen Walker believes securing that funding is unlikely. A juvenile is in custody after a car crashed while trying to escape from a traffic stop. Durham County deputies say they were trying to stop a suspected stolen vehicle. They say the vehicle took off before crashing at Fayetteville Road and Crooked Creek Parkway. The juvenile is in the hospital with minor injuries. Two new arrests today in a year-old case out of Sampson County where five people were murdered. This was the scene at a home on Highway 70 last October. Seven people in total were shot. Investigators say this all started because of a drug deal. Now two men are behind bars, 31-year-old Robert Williams and 35-year-old Derek George. Both are facing federal charges. Vaping is now banned from Cumberland County-owned buildings. Commissioners passed an ordinance at last night's meeting prohibiting vaping in county buildings on county property. The ban does not extend to facilities under the operational control of the Civic Center Commission or the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission. And Bryce Young will start on Sunday when the Panthers take on the Broncos. Coach Canales announced the change in plans at a news conference today. Andy Dalton has a sprained thumb. His family got into a car accident in Charlotte. That's what caused it. Everyone in the family is okay, by the way. But with the injury, that means Bryce Young is back in the starting lineup. The Panthers play the Broncos Sunday at 4.05. Here's another big story. It was uh, the lead of our news at 6 o'clock tonight. Maybe you saw it or you got the alert on your phone that we sent out. You might have heard of this update on the organized crime investigation happening in Cary. If not, here are the Cliffs notes real quick. Someone stole $18,000 in cash and $33,000 in jewelry from a home in Cary earlier this year. Police believe an organized crime effort out of South America may be behind it. According to a police search warrant, the woman who lives there went to pick up her kid from school. She got home 45 minutes later and found that someone had broken in. Security cameras didn't pick up any of it. When you see on the news regularly about foreign gangs that are coming into the and and it's typically you see it in big cities like where there's a lot of a lot more population and um, apartments and things like that but you haven't really seen that out in a community yet foreign gangs it sounds like something that can't be true right but this all matches the mo of a separate set of robberies in north raleigh in 2022 those folks used special equipment to rob at least 20 homes and eventually police arrested these four men they were connected to a Chilean organized crime group. Now, we have covered this subject extensively here on WRL News at 7 o'clock, specifically the Chilean organized crime rings. Earlier this year, we did an in-depth segment looking at examples of the crimes and why they're so widespread. If you want to check out the segments, you, we got them on your screen right now. You can watch them in full on the WRL YouTube page. Now, since we did that segment a couple months ago, more crimes and more investigations have taken place. In Minnesota, for instance, burglars hit more than 60 homes across 12 Minnesota cities. The, the, uh, the suspects used Wi-Fi and cell phone jammers to get past security systems. Sound familiar at all? And get this, they didn't shatter windows there. No, they cut them open. They had a fancy tool to cut them open. It's literally like a scene out of Ocean's 12 or Ocean's 11, or Ocean's 13, or Mission Impossible, any of the oceans. Officers in Philadelphia arrested four Chilean nationals in a burglary case. One of those suspects had a wedding ring that they found that belonged to one of the families in Minnesota. It turns out that group rented an SUV in Los Angeles. Then they robbed homes in Texas, Oklahoma, 
Iowa, Minnesota, Illinois, Pennsylvania, a little cross-country tour. And that's not the only group. Six people in Southern California face charges for the same exact thing. The LA Times reported on this. Investigators called them crime tourists. They committed hundreds of thefts across the nation in about 80 cities in California, Colorado, Arizona, New Jersey, Kansas, and Illinois. We mentioned that example in Wake County at the top here, but we also saw this in Rocky Mount, if you remember. Someone broke into the shop next door to a jewelry store. Then they cut a hole in the wall. They disabled the security system, cracked the safe, and took $800,000 worth of jewelry. These crimes keep happening, and they're connected to a government program called ESTA. It's a visa waiver program that gives tourists up to 90 days in the U.S. Only 41 countries are eligible for this into the U.S. Typically, when people from those countries apply, they get a background check so that the country, the U.S., knows who they are. But in Chile, they stopped playing by the rules. They stopped allowing the U.S. to look at the criminal background of the people while they were still in Chile. Now, Chile says they've reversed course on this. But again, as we said, the crimes keep happening and at least one lawmaker in California says nothing has changed. Chilean government has to vet every single passenger that gets on the plane, but they're not doing it. North Carolina lawmakers have commented on this. We asked for their comments. Senator Tom Tillis wrote in a statement, I've been heavily involved in discussions with my colleagues focused on solutions to fix our broken immigration system. And Senator Ted Budd's office wrote this program and its vulnerabilities are on Senator Budd's radar. He is extremely concerned about it. So I guess we're going to wait and see where those concerns take them. In the meantime, I don't know, get a dog or something. I don't think a Wi-Fi jammer can stop them from sounding the alarm. <laughs> do what you got to do. It really is fascinating. Scary. Fascinating. Violent crime appears to be down in Raleigh, but the city is dealing with some crime reaching 10-year highs. Public safety, a hot topic in this year's race for Raleigh mayor. Do you know where the candidates stand on the issue? I sit down with the candidates to help you break down this down-ballot race. And Kat Campbell is at the North Carolina State Fair tonight, keeping an eye on the forecast. Hey, Kat. Hey, Olivia. Hey, guys, this is my new friend, Olivia. Can you show us what you just won? Can you show us what you won? What is this? It's a unicorn. We're having good luck out here tonight, playing some games, doing some rides, eating the funnel cakes at the State Fair. I'll have your forecast for the State Fair weekends coming up. Who will lead the city of Raleigh moving forward? The seat for mayor is up for grabs this election. And you know, it's an important race, but with so much focus on who's running for president or governor, the mayor doesn't get a ton of attention. But you know, election day is less than two weeks away. I feel that way too. So we're trying to help you get to know the candidates vying to lead North Carolina's capital city. Last night we talked about affordable housing. Tonight, public safety. Aggravated assaults, robberies, and firearm thefts from vehicles are all down in Raleigh, but a WRAL report in July also showed vandalism, car thefts, sex offenses, human trafficking, and stolen property are at a 10-year high. All five candidates have public safety on their campaign platform. And in our interviews, they all said that they wanted higher salaries for police. In this year's budget, police officers and firefighters got a 5% pay increase with a possible 5% extra for good performance. Still, Raleigh lags behind several surrounding communities. Janet Cowell doesn't get specific about what she'll do for police, but she acknowledges public safety staff do not have adequate resources. We have a lower ratio of police per population than many other cities. Uh, maybe that speaks to the fact that Raleigh has been a, a safe place to live. But as we grow, yeah. um, you know, continuing to have a really thinly staffed uh, police and public safety staff is not ideal. Eugene Myrick proposes something he learned about while living in New York City. It's called Officer Next Door. Have you heard of it? The program helps officers with the cost of buying a house, including down payments. Myrick believes this could attract and keep law enforcement officers here. 
the salary is one thing, but if I can help you afford a down payment mm -hmm. as well as um, some funds to improve the home so the way you want it, that may be an incentive. So you may only start with 55000 but this type of incentive may be enough to say, okay, this is something that will make me want to stay on the uh, Raleigh Police Force. The two candidates who are very open and specific about wanting more officers and police personnel are Paul Fitz and James Shaughnessy. Shaughnessy believes the department is short about 1,000 personnel. Fitz wants to add 400 police officers. We're short about 1,000 personnel, not officers, but like 1,000 officers and civilian uh, people, uh, you know, Personnel. So civilian personnel inside yeah. the department in order to help with other things. You've got a lot of cities throughout the entire nation who have decided to defund their police departments and, and so police officers are leaving those police departments. I think it can be an incentive for them to come here as long as they know that we can pay them to be here and work for us. Terrence Ruth agrees Raleigh does need to be more competitive to attract and keep officers, but he thinks we first need to start talking about community-based crime prevention. He wants to tap into the city's vibrant academic and tech scene to help with that. Here we have some of the best tech firms here. Why don't we unleash our community to design, create, beta test solutions to safety, prevention to safety, and let's be known for our ability to beta test, to create, to innovate. Not just because innovative companies are here, but because the citizens themselves are actually creating the solutions we need in our city. So to round this all up, all the candidates here think that police officers need better pay. Some prioritize this more than others and have additional ideas to improve public safety. To watch my full interview with each candidate, go to WRAL.com or the WRAL YouTube page. Tomorrow, we talk about revitalizing downtown, how to develop, where to develop, bringing more people into the city without erasing history. Part three of our Down the Ballot Breakdown is tomorrow night, right here at 7 o'clock. Ashley, good stuff. Thank you. Kat Campbell is out at the fair introducing us to some cute kids just before the break. And uh, everybody out there enjoying some great weather, Kat. Everybody. And let me tell you, Dan, there are a lot of people out here. We're out at the Midway right now. And normally I'd be walking you through, showing you the food and some of the games. There are just too many people. I knew I was going to lose my photojournalist, Sean, behind the camera if we tried to move. But there are so many people having fun tonight. The State Fair Flyer, which are the, the uh, chairs that just slowly kind of pass over the fair. Those are packed. We've got those big drop rides going. I always love those. I think when I'm not on the air, i got to try those out one time. Just doesn't make sense with the weather iPad. And the food's great as well. I have to tell you, I've only sampled a funnel cake so far. I've kept it classic, but it was a great dinner. So let's get into the forecast for tonight. It is perfect fair weather. We had 80 for the high today, and temperatures are in the 60s out here this evening. I am in short sleeves and jeans tonight. It's nice and comfortable. Tomorrow is probably going to be even more busy at the fair because if you bring six canned food items, you will get in for free. 56 degrees at 8 a.m. by noon. Temperatures are going to be in the 70s. And as we look ahead to the afternoon, we'll be a little bit cooler than today, but not my much. Temperatures still topping out in the mid to even upper 70s tomorrow. We warm up even more by Saturday. So for your weekend, it's a bit of a mixed bag. Whatever weather you prefer, head out to the fair that day. 75 Friday, 82 Saturday, and then falling to 66 on Sunday. A 20% chance for rain on Saturday, but that is it. It is not worth canceling your outdoor plans. A few sprinkles. We've got a cold front that moves through tonight. That's our first front, but the stronger cold front will push through Saturday. Ahead of the front, a southwest warming wind means we'll be in the 80s. A couple sprinkles won't add up to anything in the rain gauge. And then high temperatures drop into the 60s behind the front. It is worth mentioning, though, that we've trimmed back cloud cover a little bit as we head into the day Sunday. It's looking pretty good. That's my kind of weather. 66 on Sunday, beautiful fair weather expected then. And we also have the Music for the Mountains concert happening at Red Hat. It'll be a great day for it. WRAL is the proud media sponsor. Next week, we've got a warming trend inside. It looks like we're going to warm back up right in time for Halloween. Trick-or-treating temperatures may start in the 70s before only dipping into the 60s. All around a pretty dry seven-day forecast. But that's great news for the North Carolina State Fair. The last time we had an entirely dry run of the fair, 
was not that long ago. It was actually back in 2016. It's beautiful out here tonight, though. We still have a little time left to go check out all the sites to see Dan and Ashley. Look at that crowd on mm. a Wednesday night. Yeah, I it's love it. packed behind yeah. you, Kat. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. So, hey, don't go anywhere, everybody. We got one last thing for you after a short break. One last thing we want to talk about. So many groups have been giving their time and money to help people in Western North Carolina, right? The Red Cross, local governments, breweries, yes. private pilots on Facebook, you name it. Tonight we want to highlight a very unique group that is giving back. Specifically to the mountains. They are first responders, not just any first responders. They are Australian firefighters from their calendar and they are the models. All right, seriously, Ooh, these guys hello. are actual firefighters. They don't just pose with puppies and kittens, they do that too. I hear one of them, at least one of them, is actually from Virginia, we know that. Oh, you, huh? Yeah, right. They have a serious social media following, millions of likes on TikTok, hundreds of thousands of followers on Instagram, and they're giving a $5,000 donation to help areas hit by Helene and Milton. That, that you, that yeah, right was kind of funny. <laughs> okay, because it inspired us. I think journalists from North Carolina should put together a calendar I started. So we have January taken care of. Um, anybody else? I just want to put that out there. Any other journalists in town, in the state, that think if it's time, that's Gerald's horse. Um, oh, boy. I think now's you know, the time. You've been working out. Actually, that I should have dieted for that. <laughs> it was actually, I was after a long weekend. Seriously, though, please donate to Western North Carolina, WRL.com. The WRL Cares donation site is still up. We're so close to a million dollars. Let's reach it. Thanks for being with us tonight. I can't unsee that. Good night. Keep watching WRL News over the air, Channel 34 and Spectrum Channel 1257.